Hello, everybody, and welcome to Chia's AMA. Today is May 25th, and it's about 1030 Pacific Daylight Time, for those of you who watch this in the future. Uh, it is a generalized AMA. Uh, we're going to talk about most everything we can talk about. There are obviously some topics we're going to have to defer, uh, but that should be pretty obvious. And otherwise, uh, the ways to get questions in is please use the Q&A section of uh, the Zoom webinar feature. Uh, we will be pulling questions from that and answering from there. Uh, and probably will not be monitoring the chat. So if you're asking us something or saying something in there, we don't notice it. Uh, we also potentially keep an eye on uh, the uh, Chia General uh, in Discord. Uh, and for those of you who want to see this some other way, it will be making its way to YouTube uh, sometime later today after all the post-processing is complete. So with that, uh, let's get started. Let me pop up the Q&A and see what we got. We've got our first question here, Gene. Uh, the first one is when merch? Believe it or not, actually, finally soon. Uh, so, <laughs> there. <laughs> but done. The, the folks answer. at Soonalytics would be thrilled to hear that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Moving the soon market price day by day. Great. Uh, the next question is, uh, will CNI have a launch partner uh, for KYC and or uh, verifiable credentials? And is there any other... Uh, probably ecosystem information we can share around our plans and, and, and larger thoughts in that space. Yeah, we sure do. Uh, we're, we're not going to announce the launch partner here today, uh, but we are working with a partner uh, who's an identity verifier, uh, has a lot of experience working with banks, is a very trusted partner, uh, who will be uh, onboarding uh, parties through a KYC verifiable credential capability uh, as a first step. So more on that soon. Uh, we're close to releasing our primitives for verifiable credentials, and you'll start to hear more about ecosystem development uh, around that time. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Gene, there's one that uh, you, you're marked here. Uh, has there been any impact on the Climate Action Data Trust or Climate Warehouse uh, from what happened at Vera recently? So uh, there's two kind of things to note there. Um, one of the things is the whole point behind the CAD Trust and the, the uh, COF is to take some of the uncertainty about all these markets out. Now, I will say a lot of the recent uh, headlines of the last, call it three or four months, have been about a class of carbon credits that aren't really considered Article 6.2 credits. These are the REDD or RED credits. So they're somewhat tangential to what's being built out of the Climate Action Data Trust. So, uh, you know, if anything, there's also, you know, the CEO of Vera had a, I think, 20-year run. So I think there's a little bit of a change in the guard there. I think it's actually a positive for the overall market. And, you know, we'll be uh, seeing the results of the CAD Trust being real here very soon. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I see that Paul has earmarked one here. Uh, what's the latest on the Ethereum bridge? Have all involved parties been selected? Is there any other context you can add uh, about the Ethereum bridge uh, concept in general? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, development is ongoing for the bridge. Uh, it is initially a, uh, a bridge of assets from uh, Ethereum uh, to the Chia blockchain. Uh, with two assets initially. Uh, <clears throat> we're starting with ETH uh, and USDC, uh, but that's TBD about other assets uh, as they um, as they grow over time. Uh, we have a security audit uh, teed up as well. You'll see news from us soon about a testnet release and then our target date for mainnet. Uh, if you're following our repos, you can see what we're up to. Uh, we're we're close. Uh, I'm hesitant to up the Soonalytics uh, scores as well, uh, so I'll just say that we're close. Um, we have had a lot of validator candidates reach out to us. Um, I, I want to stress that we are not picking the winners here. Uh, our role is to help build the tech and help provide technical assistance. Uh, there are some really strong candidates who are interested in being a lead and building their own consortium of validators, uh, and we think that's great. Uh, I, I've had a, a couple of parties reach out directly who are really strong and they're they're making moves, which I, I'm really happy to see. 
Um, I can't share who they are yet because this is their business, not ours. Uh, so we we support them, and this is on their timeline. Uh, that's about all I can say today. Um, we do want to connect uh, parties who've reached out to us directly uh, to folks uh, who want to be lead validators and, and run their own bridge. Uh, and we'll be reaching out to parties soon to do that as well. Oh, I just upped the student analytics score. <laughs> so, J uh, JM, when compressed platforming? So, uh, if you guys head over into the Discord, we have a channel called Playbit Alpha. That is where a lot of the development chat is going. If you are willing to run a development build, uh, you can farm compressed plots today. Uh, so the next major feature development we are doing before we kind of move into the, the beta phase is supporting for plotting uh, compressed plots with lower amount of DRAM. We know a lot of the folks don't have the requirements today that you need a workstation or kind of a server class system to use. So uh, once we get into the beta, then they'll just be in the typical beta builds where you can download. Um, we are doing a lot of updates to the GUI that are really going to be nice quality life improvement, not just for farming compressed plots, but for anybody farming. So we're redoing harvesting page, we are redoing the uh, plotting page and having a new farming pool kind of combo page. So yeah, a lot of GUI updates, but yeah, the compressed plot stuff uh, is in there today if you are willing to run an alpha build of the chip blockchain. Uh, is there a <clears throat> additional question for you, Jam? Is there a um, sense of when things like the plot uh, protocol is gonna be set in stone so people can start using beta builds uh, for you know plotting things for mainnet and that sort of thing? Yeah, we said once we move into the beta phase, it will effectively be like a 95% certainty that it won't change. Uh, we've been running for about, you know, two to three months farming the compressed plots in the beta program, and there hasn't been any major changes since like two, for about two months. So yeah, we don't, we don't anticipate there'll be anything to change, but you know, we have to reserve that small, small amount of probability that, that it could uh, prior to getting to production in case we find some some critical bug, but uh, yeah, there's there's no indication that that the format is going to change. I know a lot of folks, including myself, have have plotted quite a bit of space and are, and are farming it. So, thank you, uh, Gene. Uh, we have a question here about carbon tokens. Uh, what's the latest on carbon tokens? Uh, have there been any production trades of carbon credits? Uh, can you share anything else about carbon tokens? So I only can kind of share a, a categorical comment about this because there's been quite a few questions about this in various channels. When there's news about carbon tokens, there will be news about carbon tokens. How very evasive of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so we have another question here for Gene. Uh, what role do you see Chia taking in blockchain gaming and what part of our strategy overall does blockchain gaming play? So, uh, you know, we believe that Real game designers have a new metric or a new model they can use. Uh, in some ways, like freemium finally started to work, you know, a decade ago. Uh, we believe that uh, object permanence and IP permanence and IP moving between games and having royalties enforced between those moves are a really interesting new mechanic to be able to kind of create a ongoing, in some ways, circular ecosystem where, you know, you build and create a character or assets in one world. Another world uses AI to turn those characters and assets into characters and assets that match their theme and design. And, you know, you continue to potentially increase the quality or the value of those things to you. And you might even start split royalties so that when you go to that third game, both game one and game two are making some money off the fact that you now have an IP that you enjoy and love and, you know, was originally kind of from them. Uh, that really leverages some of the stuff we are uniquely capable of doing uh, around offers, around true paper -per trading, around making markets that are cross siloed, if you will. And we're realistic about who's going to be the first movers on this. And in just way that the freemium game market actually came out of Asia, most like mostly, we think that the Asian game studios are far more receptive to these kind of new models. And so we're really kind of focused on that region for early adoption in uh, showing how this works and that it's fun. Uh, and, you know, that ultimately is what matters. You know, we want to see real game studios build fun things that enjoy, that people enjoy. You know, our uh, trading card game of our own was very much a demo, but people are enjoying playing it. Uh, it is really there to give people the kind of core infrastructure they need without having to write that basic set of stuff to then go 
design games and create something interesting. So, so we think that this is a long-term play. We don't see a very short-term, you know, change on this, but we think that that medium and long-term view of games being able to have their economies and their assets leverage the true peer-to-peer -peer capabilities of what the GEO blockchain gives and using things like data layer to be able to kind of cross shard, you know, there's all sorts of really interesting things that game designers can do collaboratively. And because we take, you know, managing IP and forcing rights in the peer-to-peer -peer worlds, seriously, there are business models that can be built instead of, you know, gee, OpenSea is going to, you know, take all your value. Yay. Yeah, I think Richard had a great quote on Twitter that said, you know, bringing the trading back to trading card games. Yes. And, uh, you know, it's, it, yeah, it's it's so critical. <laughs> what is your uh, what is your highest ranked Chia TCG NFT gene, and what is your favorite? <laughs> I think I have a four, but I admit that I like did the, all the looking at all of the rankings like two weeks ago, and then was on the road, and I have not pulled together my actual play deck yet. That's fair. Gene is a yeah. busy man. I <laughs> uh, wanted to address a couple housekeeping things. We will not be talking about the IPO today. We are still in the quiet period, uh, waiting for a response from the federal government. Uh, when we have more news to share on that subject, we will absolutely be sharing that with everybody. Very obviously exciting news for us once we have news to share. Uh, we also, I don't think we'll be enabling chat today just to avoid uh, spamming and, and that sort of thing. Um, if, if someone really has a hankering for chat, maybe we can discuss it for the next time, but I think we're going to leave general chat off for this uh this one and no foods you can't honk <laughs> uh someone has asked where is bram i'll address that one as well uh bram is busy bram has a lot of things on his plate he's working on some l2 things working on some scaling things uh working on a lot of chia lisp i don't know if anybody's been paying attention to clvm and and the additions to chia lisp recently but there have been some real prolific things coming from mr cohen on that stuff uh so he is really heads down improving uh, the Chio ecosystem at large. Uh, we'd like to get him on one of these. It'll probably be later in the summer, though. He's he's got a bone right now that he's really working on, and it's great to see Bram, you know, unleashing the Bram on a problem. And Paul, you should probably follow up that with the, uh, you know, what, what about poker and how it fits in? Yeah, there was a question about what what's going on with poker. Um, so Bram continues to work on poker. Uh, you won't see poker appear on our roadmap. Poker is a prototype for some really hard tech that Bram is leading, uh, focusing on payment channels as a scaling solution or a layer two solution for Chia. Uh, this is a long-term R&D project uh, and poker and other gaming primitives will be beneficiaries of that work. Uh, so we, he continues to work on that. Uh, it's complicated stuff. Um, and when we have timing on release of that, you'll see it. Another one for you, Paul. Uh, there is a question about uh, custody primitives in the Chia GUI. Uh, what's our timeline and roadmap for adding those and, and kind of what's the our plan rollout for, for that feature set uh, as far as the larger custody ecosystem we put together for the pre-farm? Yeah, so I'll take some of this and then Gene, you might want to comment on it as well. Uh, a big part of our focus around custody and wallet development is around driving enterprise adoption. We believe that we have uh, a plan for a world-class custody solution uh, for enterprise. Uh, and of course, this, this is also usable by consumers as well. Uh, it includes hardware wallet support, um, uh, a multi-sig or M of N uh, vault, uh, in which keys are custodied by employees on devices where they don't have to think about it, uh, but their enterprise can also have a key uh, or trusted third parties can have a key to help them recover funds. Uh, you'll see more from us on this uh, in our roadmap update. Uh, really excited about this. You're also going to see uh, some news around a new wallet architecture that makes it easier for parties to deploy their own wallet infrastructure. Uh, Gene, did you want to add to that? I do. And there's a really high level thing that I want to make sure everybody's very clear on. We're focused on enterprise, not because we're not focused on the other side of the barbell too. We're focused on enterprise because we're the only public blockchain in existence that can credibly get real world money from real world users to use a public blockchain. 
So right now, that uniqueness is worth making sure that we can deliver on the actual needs of real customers like the World Bank and the IFC and quite a few more that we'll be talking about, pardon soon analytics, but soon. Um, that does mean that we're trying to solve for two different types of custody. Now, the great thing about that is, is when you treat employees like consumers, that's generally the way you want to treat them. And so you know, ultimately, we think you're going to see a set of custody primitives that's both like using a vault that you have a one of three. So you have like two hardware and maybe one paper or one very limited key. And that's your, if you will, kind of identity and personal assets. So in an employee sense, you know, that's your ability to then go sign three of five for the corporate vault when you're trying to do something specific with one of the corporate assets or one of the corporate applications. So the idea is that you'll kind of have two layers of vaulting. Now, for most end users, that first layer of vaulting will be mostly what you want. And in fact, what you'll want is a little bit more of the access controls like, you know, hey, my NFT should always have an hour clawback in that vault, where in the enterprise version, that stuff is up in the company's vaults instead of in the individual's vaults. But the whole goal here is, is to get to a world where you're using some hardware devices that you're using all the time. You're likely even using them to secure more than just your crypto assets or your crypto applications. You're probably using them to secure your email account. Thank you, Gene. Uh, we have a question for JM about uh, the, the farming and harvesting stuff that's coming out for Bladebit. Uh, do you plan to introduce GPU support uh, for the node or uh, the harvesters? What other parts of the ecosystem or what other parts of the Chia stack do we intend to add uh, GPU uh, parallelization for and, and kind of what's our release plans for that? Yeah, the way it, the current architecture is, is the de decompression compute, whether it's CPU or GPU, has to be local to the harvester. And so we are going to decouple that in a future release, which allows you to basically run the uh, decompression from a remote target. So we thought about that. Originally, originally, we had this as like a remote farmer, but you actually may want to have your GPU somewhere else, or somebody may want to offer a decompression as a service API or something like that. So we will actually make it a little bit more flexible uh, so that people can can run a bunch of different configurations. You know, kind of sort of like today we have the harvester and the farmer and the full node all separated as different services, and you can run them um, kind of wherever you want and point the uh, you know point the IPs wherever uh, with the SSL certs. We're going to do the same with the decompression algorithm. So. And then there's an additional question here, kind of in the same vein. Uh, hmm. Basically, with the Net space for Max's gigahorse plotter increasing, uh, which it isn't increasing that much, but it is increasing because it's great technology and people are interested in using it. Uh, what do you think about a potential security concern there? Uh, if something happens to Max where he's you know absconded by supermodels and doesn't update it ever again, um, what in that scenario are we worried about? And then uh, you know, are there any is there anything that we would consider in insourcing from his closed source farmer in the event of a, a massive security crisis or something like that? Yeah, so uh, while he, I don't know, I haven't seen any like, you know, uh, production versus development releases, you know, nomenclature, uh, you know, the, the farming software that he has has been available since about, I think, February or so. And uh, I, th I think at the peak now, we're seeing about 15% of the net space uh, as we, as some third party trackers like xh.farm uh, suggest. Uh, there isn't necessarily a security concern, right? These people are still farming. They can still point their plot NFT to any pool they like. They're still making the blocks. Uh, unfortunately, you know, you have to farm with his version of the, of the Chia blockchain, right? He doesn't uh, to enforce the developer fee. And so while we don't necessarily like that, as far as the security risk, uh, you know, 15%, it's not like, it, you know, it's not like there would be a security concern if it stopped farming, uh, you know, the net space would capitulate and people are making their own risk uh, by, you know, choosing to use that versus, you know, um, the open source implementation we have in Blaybit and the Chia implementation. Uh, it is it is their own risk, right? If, if, they, if the software stops working and the developers don't update it, then that is a risk. Now, uh, we haven't seen any evidence of that today. It's been pretty well maintained and updated. So, yeah. So, Justin, lots of questions about ASIC Time Lords. Yes. Uh, so 
I can't share everything because it's still kind of a Skunk Works project. I can tell you that we are comfortable disclosing it is at least two to three times faster in our testing right now. Uh, I do not currently have an ASIC time war running in my office, uh, mostly just because it's so hot here. Uh, I do have two of my team members running them though. We have two full ASIC time lords uh, up and running on private test nets at the moment. Uh, they are humming along. We are currently working out uh, some software bugs in the new VDF implementation we're putting together for these new ASIC time lords. With this new uh, super fast, super uh, like designed for this purpose hardware, some of our assumptions about how VDFs work at a base level needed to be changed because it was uh, a paraliz there were parallelization concerns between the ASIC itself and the host machine. We've kind of ironed those out now. Uh, we're at the point where we're going to move forward uh, doing stress testing, doing life cycle testing, uh, over voltage and under voltage testing, cooling and heating testing, the sort of things you do with new silicon that gets, you know, that you get delivered. Uh, these are, I would like to stress, like the only ones, the only type of machine like this that exists in the world. And so we're doing a lot of diligence here to make sure that there aren't unforeseen things when we release them to the world and put them on the blockchain that cause some kind of issue. Uh, the worst case scenario for us is releasing these too early and we've had time lords running that are two to three times at a minimum faster uh, and then they go away. That would really, really impact uh, signage point rates and things like that. So we want to avoid that sort of a hiccup on the network, which is why we're being very diligent with the work we're doing now. Uh, but I can say that work is coming along. Um, we are on pace to begin really strong and earnest testing here over the next couple of weeks. Uh, we expect the delivery of the full stock of the units from our vendor as they can get silicon boards to put them on. Uh, the limiting factor here, to be frank with you, is that there is a big crunch for just pressed silicon in general, and it's very hard to get the amount of boards we're looking for to get these seated on in a, in a timely manner. And that's kind of what's delayed us this spring. Uh, but no, never fear, we are working really hard on this. Uh, and my team is super impressed with these devices. Like there are every time someone new is involved in this project, there's some ooh ahs about like, oh, these are really great. These are so cool looking, that sort of thing. I cannot wait to share more with you guys. Uh, and you know, that's really all we can share at this time. But you know, I think it's moving along at a great clip. Hey, Paul. I've heard we've got an AMM or two around. What do you think about those? Well, let me tell you. Uh, I think there are amazing things happening in the AMM space on Chia. Uh, super happy to see Yax uh, Tibet Swap AMM launch. Uh, really impressed with his response to the security concerns and uh, being very fast, efficient, and mature about how he fixed, took it back to testnet, bug vanity, and released. And, you know, I think it's a great thing. Um, we, <laughs> uh, we've had some opinions about AMMs uh, and decentralized exchanges, um, but I think the community is going to decide what's more valuable, and we're here for it. Uh, our team has leaned in to help uh, the two different AMM projects that are launching on Chia, Tibet Swap is one. And uh, we'll continue to provide that support when folks reject or, or no. Uh, at the same time, you know, we're really big fans of offers and uh, decentralized exchange as a verb, not as a noun. And you'll continue to see us invest in growing an ecosystem around decentralized exchange, particularly as we move down the path of using verifiable credentials and credential restricted cats. Uh, we think there's huge value in that space. Uh, so we, we think both of those models are really valuable uh, and, and valid uh, ways of creating exchange. Yeah, and I'd like to add a little color on um, you know both what Yak has been doing and the security implications. Uh, there's two great things about Tibet Swap. Um, one is it's really demonstrated to a lot of folks who were, I think, Chialisp curious, but weren't sure if Chialisp could really be uh, functionally competitive with Solidity. It really demonstrates that, in fact, what you write in Chialisp can often be written better and more straightforwardly than what you would have to write in Solidity to do the same thing. And then the other thing is, it's just, I want to highlight, you know, we certainly are going to have security issues and, you know, Yak, absolutely understandable the type of security issue you had. The major difference between Solidity and Chia Lisp is in Chia Lisp, there's usually a simple and straightforward solution that fully solves the problem. You know, you've made a Thinko, not a 
finding something that's critically difficult to secure. And that was exactly the kind of class of bug Yak had. Uh, and it was relatively easy to, you know, do a slightly different approach and completely plug that security hole, similar to what happened with Cat1. Uh, and, you know, this really goes to show that, you know, Chilisp is a much better environment where, you know, we're still going to all have its software, but the solutions are much more tractable, simple, stronger, and really build trust. So, you know, want to thank Yak for both of those things, you know, really demonstrating the resilience there and then also demonstrating to a lot of folks uh, how real Chilisp is as an operating language for a public blockchain. Mr. Justin, what about the security content of 1.8.0? Glad you asked. Uh, we have a, a release schedule for those. Uh, we typically try to shoot for 51% uh, before we release the postmortem for an issue. Uh, that happened this week. I believe Wednesday or Tuesday this week, we reached 51% uh, of the nodes we're tracking uh, have uh, upgraded to 1.8.0 or 1.8.1. I think that they we're shooting for next week. We may want to go to as much as 60% for this one, just because it's, uh, you know, we want to have as many people patched as we can before we disclose it. Um, this one is a little more serious than our ones we've disclosed in the past, which is why we're being a little more hesitant to disclose uh, right at 51%. Uh, but never fear, it is coming and it should be next week or the week after, uh, depending on, on patch uptake. We've got one here for Gene. Uh, when speaking to governments, banks, and enterprises, which part of Chia's offerings are they most impressed by? So I think the best way to put this is there's kind of two categories of what they're impressed with. One category is what I would call a base layer of gotta haves. Um, when, you know, these serious folks have looked at blockchains, they've looked at Bitcoin, they've looked at Ethereum, you know, their concerns are that these things aren't decentralized that they aren't compliant with the regulations of the United States, that they, you know, are using Solidity, and Solidity is something that most of the serious, like, bank IT teams are just not willing to trust money to. So there's that first category of, you know, really clearing the, wow, we, you know, we really could adopt a public blockchain. We, we've, never, we've never done the analysis and gotten to that step. So that's, like, step one. But the one that really answers this question is when we demonstrate offers. When you show a major institution a peer-to-peer -peer trustless offer in real time on mainnet, it causes the light bulb to go off. And all of a sudden, we're in a completely different conversation, which is generally them running through all the problems in the organization they might be able to solve this way. So it really is the power of peer-to-peer -peer direct offer files. You know, I was with the government uh, and they were joking about how they've been talking to some Ethereum folks earlier that week that were saying they were doing peer to peer DeFi and they were laughing. There was no such thing. I was like, it was our third meeting. So it wasn't, this wasn't new. I was like, you remember I'm here to demonstrate that. Right. And they're like, Oh yeah, well go. And so we did. And the light bulb went off for them of, wow, that actually works. And so it's really getting people comfortable with offers, data layer, and ultimately uh, custody. Because, you know, a lot of our customers don't yet understand how important custody is going to be to their day-to-day -day lives. But when we start showing them, and we have, what custody is going to look like for them and how tractable it finally is, you know, it really changes their concerns about the risks. The, you know, this all becomes now really a IT architecture decision instead of, you know, all of these strategic issues that are on the table. Thank you. Uh, sort of the same vein. Uh, there's a question here about our marketing efforts. Where are we spending our marketing efforts now? There's been some rumblings in the past about marketing focused at retail or not. Uh, how do we feel about our marketing efforts thus far? And, and is there anything about marketing in general that we can share? So um, first two things I don't want to have to talk about, but I think I should. Um, some people have been personal about our marketing team by name. That's not acceptable. Now, that out of the way. Um, one piece of marketing that everyone wants us to do is to go pump and dump, and we're not going to do that. So, you know, if you are anywhere close to thinking that's what we're going to do from a marketing perspective, you don't understand, you should get out of our community. Okay, with those two really unhappy statements out of the way, um, our core focus right now is landing those additional major use cases outside of carbon. We really need to prove it's not just a carbon uh, adoption, it's going to be other real world use cases with real money and real business needs on them. So our best customer right now is the person at a bank, a government, an enterprise 
who has a business need that a blockchain would considerably either increase the profitability of or massively decrease the cost of. And so our marketing is very much focused on them. Um, you know, many of you saw our rollout of virtual private blockchain. Um, it is a marketing concept. It is not technology. The technology is tech you already know. But the idea behind it is that there is a real market for private blockchains today. So there are people going, hey, I need a blockchain. And they go out and they shop for private blockchains. We want to get in that shop process and show them that they could use a public blockchain to meet all of the criteria that they already have for wanting a private blockchain, but get even more value and capability beyond what they would get if they used a private blockchain. So, you know, when you peel back the audience there, that's kind of two different customer bases. There's a customer base who are primarily going to be issuing assets and managing them. And there's a customer base who are going to be doing things like the Climate Action Data Trust, where you have a coalition that has a market need to coordinate, but they're relatively peers. It's going to be kind of more of a data layer buyer. Uh, but neither of those buyers necessarily knows what product they need to buy from us. And so we want to be pretty you know, broad about reaching out with the VPB construct so that people get that for whatever reason you're looking at private blockchain, you absolutely now can use the most secure, most decentralized and most compliant public blockchain that's ever existed. Now, also I'll add that our media coverage is generally a major media event a week, if not two. So if anybody thinks that's not marketing, I'd love to see your definition. Yeah, there's other practical stuff like you guys have seen. The, the newsletter has gotten a refresh. There's uh, weekly pages getting updated on the website. These are all public-facing retail type marketing. So yeah, the team is busy. <laughs> yeah, all those new web pages you see take a little time to build, vet. And by the way, you, you all still find nits even after we've done all that. <laughs> Paul, we have a, a slate of questions for you here about the roadmap, uh, asking about, you know, the end of Q2 is coming up, um, you know, the, the roadmap kind of extends to the end of this year, but, you know, things have changed kind of strategically for us since the beginning of this year. Uh, do we plan to publish an update? And then uh, the other additional question for the roadmap was, are there, is there anything significant that's going to be changed in the roadmap uh, that you can talk about for this year? Yeah, so I do want us to have an update on the roadmap for the end of Q2. Our public roadmap uh, ends at Q2 and has a lot of things that are under consideration for the second half of the year. Uh, since our last uh, public roadmap update, a number of those under consideration items have moved into, now we're working on them. <laughs> uh, and so I expect us to be in a position to share the updated roadmap with the community before the end of uh, this quarter. Uh, and our aim is to have that go out to the end of the year. Uh, there are, of course, always going to be some changes as priorities shift, uh, and also as some technical realities set in uh, as we get into implementation. Um, I don't want to speak out of turn just yet. Um, we will have a roadmap discussion, and I'll, I'll share the updates about what's new and what's changed uh, at the right time. Yeah, I would just also add that like, it's not a significant deviation from what we've generally been thinking about. It's certainly going to lift up some uh, things that are really valuable to enterprises, but also to things like data layers of service, just giving people more capabilities and access control. Uh, and so from that perspective, you know, it's that, and it's also obviously continuing to deliver on advanced custody and making that more user-friendly, both for end users and enterprises. Yeah, I, I, I want to just add on to that, that, you know, three really huge product priorities for us are offers, data layer, and custody. And you're going to continue to see more things ship from us that support those three huge product pillars. Uh, there were some questions in the, the Q&A about wallet SDK um, and custody stuff. To us, these are all very much intertwined. And so when we think about rolling out uh, a wallet SDK, for example, uh, we're going to roll out a uh, new wallet infrastructure and a new architecture that allows for massively scalable enterprise wallet management uh, that is uh, highly relevant to consumers, uh, that supports hardware wallets, uh, uh, and really advanced custody capabilities. Uh, you'll see us shortly release uh, our first advanced custody capability, which is a clawback uh, capability. Uh, and we've talked about this uh, on Twitter spaces. Uh, there's, there's nothing new to share here. Uh, it's landing soon. Uh, and it's really the first of a handful of really significant 
capabilities that are super relevant to our enterprise customers, uh, but also to end user questions. And I want to add, you know, we talk about um, offers, data layer, and custody. There's a fourth almost as valuable, and that is uh, verifiable credentials. Because when you add those four things together, you really give a tremendous amount of capability that's almost available nowhere else. And, you know, we don't necessarily always want to surface the, the verifiable credential concept because it's not as, I don't know, differentiated and, and critical to, you know, why you choose the GEO blockchain like offers and data layer and custody are, but it's uh, all, almost the same. And so, you know, you'll see it having real attention in the back half of this year. Yeah, it, to my mind, verifiable credentials, the way we're shipping it is uh, adds critical value to offers. Uh, it, it enables you to uh, set up trades uh, that are uh, credential restricted. Uh, and so the only way that you can accept an offer uh, using a verifiable credential is if you have that credential. And that'll be useful for a number of uh, contexts um, that relate to some pretty important enterprise cases that we'll start talking about in the back half of this year. Uh, that's a great segue, Paul. Uh, there's an additional question about uh, VCs and how they interact with offers. And there was a specifically, uh, if VCs could have an offer that can only be accepted by a specific user or what other kind of controls VCs we see adding to offers and, and the other assets and tokens on the chain. Yeah, it's interesting. You, we haven't really uh, identified a, a primary use case for VCs around accepting an offer from one person, but there's really no reason why you couldn't use the primitive that way as well. Uh, the VC is issued uh, to individuals. You can construct a VC uh, that would be applicable just to one person. Uh, and then the only person who could accept that offer is the one who is, who is holding on to that VC. So, so there's a way you could do it. We just haven't seen that as a primary use case. We think about VCs as applicable to uh, categories of users that could be uh, KYC people who are in a particular jurisdiction, uh, who have a particular uh, credential. They could be accredited investors, for example. Uh, but in an enterprise context, you could also imagine that the VC applies to particular people inside the organization who have access to, uh, to certain types of data in the organization. Uh, so those are some of the primary cases that we think about for verifiable credentials. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Gene, we have a question here for you. Uh, this one's, I, I thought this was fun, so I'll push this on the top. Uh, have you watched Silicon Valley, the series from, from HBO? And have you found anything in common with Chia? Uh, and then after your answer, I would like to, to you know, talk about how I am actually Guilfoyle. <laughs> so uh, of course we've watched Silicon Valley and it does actually turn out that Silicon Valley is partially influenced by the Chia development process. So our academic advisors were advisors to the film, uh, Dan Benet and others. And in fact, we're taking bits and elements of what Bram was working on at the time. And then the, uh, you know, uh, writers were riffing off that. But yes, there were absolutely elements in that story that were influenced by the Chia startup uh, experience. Uh, one of our other advisors is most likely uh, one of the uh, main characters, actual original influence. So if you ever meet Brian Zisk, you will have already met someone else you've seen in Silicon Valley before. I didn't know that, but that's hilarious, and I get it. Oh, yeah. Which, by the way, Zisk is a great guy. Um, yeah, awesome. Super, guy. super huge Chia Maxi. Love the guy. He's a great guy. Uh, there was another question, Gene. Um, <clears throat> it seems like we have our fingers in a lot of pies, or we're doing a lot of things. Uh, do you feel we're stretching our people thin, or do you feel like our you know strategic footprint is kind of you know where it needs to be? So I don't think we're stretching our people thin. Um, you know, it, it, we grew really, really quickly that kind of slowed nine to 12 months ago. And what a lot you're seeing is that we planted a lot of seeds a year and change ago that are now bearing real fruit in real ways. It also means that our team has gotten, you know, used to and more capable of working together to be more efficient, to get things done with higher quality. You know, all the right things are happening. You know, it's a kind of classic, the team is gelling. So a lot of the reason why you're seeing higher output is, you know, we've got the marketing team up to speed. We've got all these things that used to often take, 
you know, these days, something important gets handed off, scheduled, written, replied to in days instead of weeks, because there are more people to get those things done and everyone knows who to go to. And so a lot of those coordination issues are not there anymore. And you're seeing the results in a higher tempo of really cool stuff. A couple more rapid fire questions for Eugene. Uh, is there anything special about the Chia blockchain that uniquely allows offers or data layer? Can these technologies be in, implemented on other UTXO chains? Uh, and an addendum there, we're actually using a model called CoinSet. We're not technically UTXO, uh, but I'll you know, leave that to the boss man here. Yeah, I think the best way to put this is that if Bitcoin were to adopt Chia Lisp, that they would too be able to do a lot of what we're doing here. In fact, all these applications work on both. Um, there are some subtleties uh, to what we've done that make it easier to do what we do, and they would have to do some difficult things about like creating coin IDs where there's only transaction outputs today. So there's some interesting architecture challenges for them to do it. Um, I will say of the other UTXO chains, most of them do not have the correct approach about how to aggregate UTXOs and get out of the you know only spend once problem. Uh, that's fixable by you know again replicating, but you know ultimately we only see one blockchain that could replicate this and that is Bitcoin. Uh, we wouldn't be surprised if Bitcoin continues to go from what they're already doing because ordinals and BRC20 are absolutely influenced by Chia and our success with NFT1 and CATS. However, when you dig in, you'll find them to be very inferior copies because they don't have the Chia list capabilities to you know, have backward looking covenants and vaults and all the things that we can do. Now there is, I'd say, gaining traction that to the extent that Bitcoin is going to go do these things that are important for self-custody and other other important kind of scaling issues, that Chia keeps coming up as a you know solid way to solve that problem for them. Uh, we're extremely excited about that idea. We're very supportive. You know, Bram would be directly involved in helping the Bitcoin core guys do this if they chose to. Um, ultimately, we think that it would be amazing for interoperability between the two chains. You know, you literally could uh, make your decision about how and why you wanted a custody here versus there. Though we think two things are going to be real. One is that real world assets have a uh, strong pull from a network effect to other real world assets. So, you know, it's things like the carbon trading increases as these other banks and enterprise assets are available in chain. You know, those entities have to be very careful about their carbon footprint. So the, you know, proof of work issue will remain. It will mean that, you know, a lot of banks and governments won't be able to necessarily use Bitcoin. But it is a much richer ecosystem if Bitcoin and Chia have chia list capabilities and things like offers and data layer, even they might be named slightly different things. Point being, you might be able to like cross-chain offer in real time. And that's kind of cool. Uh, and ultimately, you know, we think that will be the preferred chain for businesses and governments and enterprise use. And, you know, will be pretty fungible between the two chains. So if you felt like you wanted to keep your Chia on Bitcoin, then you could. That's great. Uh, continuing with the forward-looking uh, ideology here, can you share what our biggest goal is here at GIA for the remainder of this year? Uh, there are two things that need to get done this year. Uh, one is that we're looking forward to starting to talk about our use cases outside of carbon that are as big or bigger than the carbon market. Um, we really want to make sure that that story is obvious to others because the amount of charlatanism in this space is so high that the way that people are going to understand that this is a credible and honest solution is that our customers are ultimately going to be telling that story. So, you know, a lot of people sit there complaining that CAD Trust is out promoting CAD Trust. It's perfect. I want CAD Trust promoting CAD Trust. It's very easy to point at it and have people go, wow, that is a real use. And wow, people are focused on the problem that it's trying to solve and not the blockchain that it's using. However, we're the only blockchain that they could use. And that's an important step. So as we continue that piece, we just need to be able to further make the argument to Wall Street, to Main Street, that these are technologies that are going to have tremendous positive impact and give it to people in a way that they can start to understand it. Because, you know, the average user outside of the blockchain space doesn't know a Solana from a Chia from a Bitcoin. The thing that's going to change that is when a bank they recognize, the World Bank, the IFC, buyers in the carbon market use this blockchain to get business things done, they don't have to understand the technical merits, they can rely on the difficult and real decisions that those real world users made to adopt. Uh, and then obviously, you know, it has always been part of our plan to become a public entity. We are excited about that process. You know, can't predict when, but, you know, I'm very comfortable that should market conditions continue to improve a bit and they have gotten better uh, than even the last time I've kind of talked about it. 
that uh, will be in a place to be able to complete that and take on the very good governance infrastructure and the high compliance environment that that will ultimately drive. So we're really excited about those two things. That to me is the two final credibility steps because you know post those two things, it's even that much easier to have a conversation with a bank or a government. And you know, on the first thing, it's like, look, there's their big four audited financials that's reported in Edgar. They've got street coverage. People uh, believe, you know, the SEC has no clear objections. Those kinds of things are quite important. And then the other side, you know, that customer list, we think in certain these categories, when you pick up one of the top three or four customers in those categories, that then the rest are going to fall online very quickly. Thank you, Gene. Uh, JM. Uh, we got one for you. This one's a little, little more fun. When are you and Harold going to take a break? You guys have been releasing a new release like once a day for months now. Yeah, I just want to thank the the dev team that's been working on the compressed plots and farming. You know, we don't have a huge team; it's just a handful of people. And I remember, yeah, Gene and I had to come to the defense of the developers one night when people were just kind of harassing us of like, just well, well come on, why aren't you guys working twenty four seven? So people have families. They have to move. There's life stuff. So yeah, they've just been doing a tremendous job of getting things out. And uh, so don't worry about me. I'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, I love work. I, I love plotting farming. I wouldn't be doing it if I doing it and uh, spending the time there if I didn't. So. We actually have a problem here where we employ like really, really passionate, engaged people, <laughs> and we have to like force them to go take a break. Uh, <laughs> it's something that. Gene and I discuss at length uh, in our like him teaching me how to be a better manager chats we have uh, where it's like make your guys go take a break to avoid burnout we're very cognizant of that uh, and you know we appreciate you guys being concerned uh, but if we felt like JR Moore Herald was you know in need of it we would you know send them on a boat or something so they couldn't have a computer. Paul we've got a couple questions here uh, the first one any news on ledger or other hardware wallet support. Sure. Yeah, this is uh, pretty hot and heavy for us. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, three big product priorities for us this year are, are offers, data layer, and custody. Hardware wallets, big part of custody. Uh, I'll first start with Ledger. Uh, so for folks who haven't been following along at home, uh, Ledger uh, announced support for BLS uh, natively, which is super exciting. This was a major uh, stumbling block for supporting Chia on Ledger. Uh, however, uh, we are still awaiting Ledger support for uh, BLS APIs in their simulator. Uh, we also are uh, not permitted to sideload apps that we develop onto Ledger. Uh, so while BLS is now natively supported on Ledger, we still are not really able to develop uh, for Ledger until those changes have been made. Uh, we continue to press them. We have access to the highest levels of people at Ledger. Uh, and I'm hopeful that they are unblocked on their side so that we can move ahead. Uh, at the same time, uh, there is another hardware wallet uh, player that we are actively engaged with uh, who has come to us. <laughs> Uh, and wants to work with us. Uh, refreshing to have people contacting us saying we really want to work with Chia. Uh, so really excited for the day where we can announce who that partner is and plans for it. Uh, but we are actively driving that. Um, uh, I would expect that we have a hardware wallet that is supported by the end of the year. Um, I don't want to commit to a date on that just yet. Uh, but there is a third ace in the hole that you're going to hear from us very soon on, uh, which is uh, super exciting. Uh, Gene, I don't think we want to get into any details today about it. I can give this one hint. Chia yeah. is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, as an uh, addendum to that, I've been messing around with the open hardware wallet standard uh, that some people have put together kits for and other people have been contributing to. I think there's legs there as well, right? Like I, I think that the community has identified this is a gap. Uh, and I think there's some less than super mature solutions out there right now. And we're working on, you know, some more solutions that, you know, to, to Paul and Gene's point here. Yeah, also there's one really big difference to our approach from other blockchains. And that is, you know, our view is that Ledger is a device which you do not back up and you do not ultimately trust much. 
And in fact, it's part of your vault that if you lose that ledger, you might use your iPhone or a different ledger to replace that ledger and go forward. So it, it's a very different paradigm. We don't really want people to have to back up their private keys. We want them to manage a set of private keys that they do not actually know nor can escape from the secure element. And that is not necessarily what the market is doing, at least in ledger category right now. So, you know, there are a bunch of different ways to get there. Some of those are with offline uh, machines today. And that's kind of what we've done with the pre-farm and what Justin was kind of talking about. So, you know, as we build toward a vault paradigm where the vault is really your wallet, uh, and then you've got these signing elements that manage your vault, that's how you kind of get to this world where don't back up private keys, throw them away and restart. Yeah, I, I, I just want to add to that, that uh, you'll hear a lot more from us soon about this vault paradigm. But the TLDR is, from a design point of view, we think we have the blueprint for solving the crazy, weird user experience problems you see in crypto today. Uh, Gene mentioned not having to back up your private key. This is super critical. People don't want to have to hammer their seed phrase into metal and bury it in their backyard. Like that's great if you're a doomsday prepper, uh, but this is not how you get blockchain to be mainstream. And it's certainly not how you get blockchain into enterprise. So you'll hear more from us on that. Seth Jenks on our product team uh, is leading some design thinking on this. And you'll hear more from us on that very soon. Yes, and the point is, is that we actually expect that the methods we're going to talk about from a hardware and limited paper wallets perspective will be more secure than a doom prepper, you know, stainless steel buried in the yard, uh, though you'll still be able to do that too. We're not saying you can't. Now, you know, this added a question, you know, look, Ledger had a, a PR boo-boo, you know, does that mean you change what you're doing with them? We don't think you should rely on them that way, period. Um, we think that what they build is totally legitimately interesting as one of the elements of your security custody vault, but not as the, you know, current way that like, if you run it for Bitcoin or Ethereum, it is the thing. We think it should be a thing, not the thing. So it doesn't change our interaction with them in any way. We still want to get support for them alive as soon as possible because it is an excellent alternative, but I think we're gonna have some really fun alternatives that people are gonna like. Yes. Uh, on this same subject, uh, RMKR, my AMA best friend, uh, I'm completely unfamiliar with hardware wallets. Uh, do you see a hardware wallet as a useful device for managing funds in a cold wallet? Or, you know, how does it compare to an HSM? Is that the same device? Uh, so to take a step back, uh, at the end of the day, what we have built for the pre-farm right now using the HSM code that's uh, live and, and open source, and the devices we've implemented to, you know, for the multiple signature uh, setup the pre-farm has, are hardware wallets. They are a different type of hardware wallet than uh, the community and like crypto ecosystems at large would think of. Uh, they use slightly different technology and they don't have uh, a secure element in them. And so uh, this, the private key there is not in a non-exportable state. It is stored in a way that the physical controls uh, make it non-exportable, uh, but there is no hardware guarantee that the the key cannot exit device. This is an important distinction. Uh, if you are, uh, you know, a custody agent selling custody, or someone who, uh, you know, locks up a lot of their net worth inside of a crypto wallet, uh, because you want to know that uh, no one can snoop your keys, especially if it's not in a multi-key paradigm, uh, and you know, steal all your funds. There are devices like the Ledger, which we thought had an unexportable private key, and I think probably still does, based on, you know whether or not you have certain firmware updates. Uh, there are other options like Apple. Uh, their devices are very, have very strong uh, secure elements in them. All of the new uh, Mac devices, in, including their desktops and their uh, MacBooks, as well as iPhones have very nice secure devices that I'm pretty confident things aren't exported from. At the end of the day, uh, your risk model and your trust model is gonna kind of dictate what solution works best for you. Uh, but I would say that the best advice is there are towards devices that you're certain have a secure, uh, secure element on them. Uh, and if not have controls in place like we do, physical access controls, 24 seven video monitoring, that sort of thing thing on devices so that you can get the same kind of good vibe feeling a secure element would give you without having to have, you know, off the shelf community or off the shelf, shelf consumer hardware that has a uh, secure element on, uh, on the actual 
board. Uh, what we've done to mitigate that is like no radios on the board and then our actual physical custody controls around the HSMs. Um, it is fairly novel, but it isn't where we want to be. We want we think that there's a lot of room for improvement there, which is kind of the stuff Gene and uh, Paul have been talking about for the last 15 minutes or so. Okay, uh, let's see what we what else we have here. Uh, we have some questions about. Uh, let's go with. Uh, sorry, guys, I'm giving my own answer and wasn't uh, setting up the next one. Uh, here's a fun one. Jim Cramer is apparently bearish on Chia, which I think is a great bull signal. Uh, he seems to understand the fundamentals. Any plans for Gene to appear on an interview with Jim Cramer? And kind of what are your thoughts on Jim Cramer in general? First, with those who don't have context, a, a Church of Chia NFT burning event had an AI version of Mr. Kramer. So sure, just to make sure everybody's clear on what we're saying. Uh, though I would say that um, I kind of don't want to get on a Jim Kramer show because I don't want him to like Chia. Inverse Kramer is a thing. T totally fair. Uh, Paul, uh, there is a question here for, are there any new updates for Clawback, Dowcats, Randomness Beacons? Uh, kind of everything kind of in that uh, the sphere that you haven't kind of talked about yet as far as, you know, the stuff that was talked about on the roadmap. Yeah, you'll see us release uh, Clawback in the GUI uh, for a first use case uh, in a upcoming release. Um, as uh, some of you may know, we released uh, Clawback as a primitive for other wallet developers to start building. Um, and so that's already out there. Uh, but we're we're getting ready to demonstrate this as a, a new capability in our own reference wallet. Uh, the the first capability is around something that Bram refers to as anti-bricking. Uh, this will enable you to claw back funds to your wallet if you fat finger a spend to an address. Uh, this is a real thing. Um, it happened last year where a major cryptocurrency exchange, who I will not name, uh, accidentally sent several hundred million dollars to another exchange and had to call them and ask for it back. Uh, this is a solved problem with anti-breaking callback. Uh, we will um, uh, shortly announce in our roadmap update uh, a capability called cold storage callback in which uh, the theft of funds uh, through private key compromise uh, enables you to claw back the funds uh, to a different cold storage uh, recovery address. Uh, and this is uh, how we're thinking about solving uh, key recovery, uh, how we're thinking about theft. Uh, you think about Kevin Rose and his NFT collection being stolen, uh, cold storage recovery clawback uh, solves for that problem. Uh, so in our roadmap update, uh, you'll you'll see news on clawback. Uh, you'll also see our plans for Dowcats. Uh, we are... Uh, very close to finishing our DAO primitives. Uh, this has been a massive effort uh, led by uh, Sebastian and Matt Howard uh, in our engineering team. Uh, they, uh, Matt Howard in particular is the brain trust behind uh, our DAO primitive engineering development. We are so close. <laughs> um, and I'm not going to raise the value of uh, soon token any further by getting into details on dates, but we're very close. Uh, so I'm really excited to get that um, at the door. Uh, was there a third uh, one there? A oh, randomness beacon. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is still in our bucket of under consideration. We have a lot of other uh, uh, priorities that come in front of randomness beacon. Um, and, and so you'll continue to see that under consideration, but not committed on our roadmap when we do our update. Yeah, I want to be clear. It'll happen. We just aren't aren't sure when. Then an additional one for you, Paul. Uh, thanks for doing the AMA. Uh, when will be the next uh, product spaces or or product AMA? Uh, if you have a timeline for that. Yeah. So we uh, we do plan to have a uh, a Twitter Spaces uh, product hour specifically around verifiable credentials. Uh, we wanted to get the chip out there first. Uh, which uh, some of you may have seen, we've uh, released the chip for VCs uh, and for credential restricted cats. Um, we wanted to let that marinate for a week or so, and then you'll see an announcement from us about a Twitter spaces to talk about uh, VCs. Uh, 
we will do a Q&A for the roadmap. I'm not sure we'll use Twitter spaces for that. Uh, we probably want to be able to show some visuals during that, and Twitter spaces doesn't really work too well for that. Uh, so stay tuned for when that roadmap Q&A topic will be uh, around the time we announce our new roadmap. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we got one here for Gene. Um, this is more of a fun one uh, to break up kind of the super serious we've been doing. Uh, I think the official Discord server has been super successful. We agree. Uh, had, and has been far more engaging. We also agree. Uh, have you caught Bob in the act of trying to infiltrate it? Well, it's also a question of do we think that uh, Anon Bob on Twitter is the same one from Keybase as well? So I'll put those two things together. Uh, the Discord launch uh, has a lot of the mechanisms that we were using to keep Bob down, actually. And those mechanisms seem to be working. Uh, you know, we have definitely seen a large migration and some new folks that we had not been, you know, conversing with from Keybase, and that's been great. Uh, I think it is a bit more accessible, and we're excited about that. And we're also looking forward to some additional security features that Discord's going to ship here sooner or later. Um, but, uh, you know, we have not had a Bob problem by having, you know, limited uh, pseudonymity required. Uh, that is why we have limited pseudonymity required. We want to have a speed bump that at least you had to, you know, invest in creating an account. But, you know, for people who are worried about anonymity, right? Sexy Orc has a Discord account. Uh, you know, if you've got a, a non-GitHub, that's excellent. There are lots of different ways to kind of meet our threshold of uh, being allowed into the Discord. Uh, on the Bob question, uh, Bob's a smart dude, uh, but it's not a non-Bob. A non-Bob's smarter and funnier. Uh, so, you know, I think that's more people riffing on the Bob concept. Great. Thank you, Gene. Uh, there's another question from RMKR. Uh, re regarding enterprise security, uh, do you plan to or how do you tackle the least common denominator problem? Uh, this being employee X can barely maintain logging into their email, but now has to have an RSA key or some other security paraphernalia to access the, the enterprise platform. Do we have something in the works to address that? And kind of what are our thoughts about these sort of common security problems? Yeah, we actually think we have a very good set of solutions for that. Um, we're going to take it and make it the world more like physical keys than it's been before. And by the way, this is in parallel with what's going on with FIDO2 and you know Google and Microsoft and Apple and everybody. Um, the idea here is that you're going to have two hardware devices and in our world, a backup entity probably. So the way this would work is like your primary hardware device would be the one you use day to day to log in, to spend, to you know issue a Chia asset token to do all those kinds of things. Now, the way you're doing that is you're authenticating to your vault, and then your vault is authenticating to the vault of the tool that the built company built to, you know, issue an asset or manage a VPV database. Right. Um, the idea is if you lose your primary, your secondary is in your office desk in a safe. It's not a real risk if somebody steals that because it won't. Um, necessarily move your funds immediately. What it primarily will do is rekey in a new primary device. So, you know, if you lost it, you can use that. Now, if you screw up both, the idea is, is that your company may have an additional public key, but that's pretty restricted. And the idea there is that by making it so like it might take seven days or five days to recover, you're making it very clear from a control perspective that, you know, you believe controller john smith is still in control of controller john smith's keys but when he loses them you know during that window that he doesn't have them and he'll get them all back here very shortly and therefore that identity kind of reaffirms so so the whole goal here is is that like you don't have to actively store a separate set of keys as an enterprise it's not an additional threat vector because if someone were to compromise that everybody's primary keys would overrule it so you know, you've now got this kind of defense in depth using time where you got to lose a lot of things and screw up a heck of a lot of stuff before even your least technically savvy user can't just can recover. Excellent. Thank you. JM, question for you. Are you comfortable talking about timeline for what's coming with uh, the new Bladebit releases? Is it still coming the end of June, end of July? Kind of what is your, what are your thoughts on that? I mentioned the the highest priority feature development for us is getting Blade Bakuda, which is the GPU plotting, in the hands of more people, which have lower system requirements, lower amount of DRAM desktops. So this is our, our top priority. It's being actively developed. Um, if you want the latest and greatest, yeah, come over to the Blade Alpha channel in the Discord. That's where, where you'll hear about it first. 
Great. I have a question for all of us. Uh, I have two, actually. I'm going to ask the first one and then the second one. Uh, the first one is, who's your dream customer? Like, if you could just pick somebody out of a hat to work with uh, as a customer for our blockchain, who would it be? And I'll, I'll go around the horn. We'll start with Gene, and then you, you other guys can answer as well. So I have to kind of skip over some of the dream customers because, well, reasons. <laughs> um, but uh, I look forward to, in a decade or so, uh, having a vendor relationship with the United States Treasury by which the US CBDC runs an AZK roll up on Gia. That's awesome. How about you, Paul? <laughs> I too share the dream of uh, uh, a Chia based CBDC. <clears throat> uh, as probably a number of you know, I'm uh, super passionate about uh, bringing real world assets to Chia blockchain. Um, I want to see uh, trading of real world assets at scale. Um, and I, so I, I, I think, you know, major asset issuers are uh, kind of dream customers. Uh, but seeing, you know, the major brokerage firms, seeing players like Robinhood come to Chia and enable their customers to trade uh, on Chia blockchain is, is a, you know, long term vision for uh, for. That's awesome. Uh, JM, uh, anybody besides Intel that's a dream customer for you? Yeah, as you guys know, kind of manage our storage partners. It's really funny. A lot of people talk about this transparency and auditability about supply chain and this really great use case for blockchain and supply chain, yet we haven't seen it. Um, yeah, we are talking a lot about in the circular drive initiative, how do you track assets end to end? How do you make sure like when a device is sanitized, you get a certificate of sanitization? Like how would that work on the blockchain? So it's, it's in fact, people have been talking about this for years, but there are nothing that's really being actively used. So I would love to actually see some of these solutions kind of go end to end and finally integrate into some of the circularity and sustainability work that we're doing. So, Thank you. Uh, my answer to this one, um, I would say that uh, it, it would be fantastic if you know, global banking settlement, uh, big credit card companies, that sort of thing, uh, were settling things on chain. I think that's the those are the those are the brass ring kind of things that that I think is a public blockchain we aspire to, uh, and I think it's you know that's the kind of stuff that like really gets me out of bed in the morning and really excited about this project is the, you know the long tail kind of adoption opportunities we have for really big uh, problem solving and in, in finance. I think I maybe cut you off, Gene. No, not at all. Okay. Uh, the other question I had for all of us was, what is your favorite community project or what community project has got you really excited right now uh, since the last AMA? You want to take this one, Gene? I love the Yak. Now, I also love uh, the R bots now between Dexy and Yak. That's cool. And I'm looking forward to Hash Green's uh, competition there, too. How about you, JM? Uh, I am just blown away with the work that uh, the slowest time lord has done on xdh.farm. You know, we took my, you know, archaic uh, Excel spreadsheets and turned them into a nice web calculators for farming and plotting to help help our farmers look at profitability and compress net space and all, all kinds of cool stuff. So, <laughs> uh, Paul? Uh, it, it's too close to tell um, between uh, Yak and Tibet Swap. Uh, which is just killer to watch that come to life. Um, and our friends at Stably, uh, who, as you know, many of you have seen, we had uh, an initial launch that was a little bumpy, with technical issues. But man, uh, the ability to wire transfer uh, millions of dollars and uh, almost instantly uh, convert to USDS is a huge, huge on-ramp for Gia. Uh, and you're going to see more coming from those folks soon. Uh, seeing the launch of wrapped Bitcoin and wrapped ETH is, uh, I think, really valuable as well. Um, stably ramp. like They are just knocking it out of the park over and over again with what they're doing in the ecosystem. And you're going to start to see a lot more adoption as these on-ramps come. My answer is Yak as well, but maybe for a different reason. As like the resident security wonk, I think that the way that that project handled a massive security bug and then relaunched with a plan to mitigate future security issues as well, I think is a shining example for the community. And anyone who wants that experience, you know, the consultation and, and guidance we were able to provide there, please reach out. Like, I really want to stress that it is on our interest that community projects are successful and don't have security issues like that. And 
you know, we are here to, you know, help you, you know, guide you through that process. Not necessarily we'll be able to resolve it for you, but certainly our expertise can be leaned on here uh, to make community projects successful. I don't want to say we're the arbiter of like everything that's legit, but certainly uh, if you're in the community and are looking for uh, some mentorship or guidance, uh, you know, there, there's someone here at Chia we can definitely connect you with to, to help with that for sure. I also want to throw out an honorable mention to Data Layer as a service. I think that's an exciting little project. Yeah, shout out to, to Michael there. That's a really cool project. I'm excited to see that that one get legs as well. Uh, we have one for you here, Gene. Uh, after IPO, will we will we be able to do AMAs anymore? So, frankly, uh, this AMA exists in the same operating environment that any after IPO AMAs will exist. Like so, you know, the extent that we're able to talk about certain things, uh, we can, and the, the extent we can't, we can't, uh, and we're already doing that today. So. Uh, you know, the the company you're interacting with is pretty much the way that those interactions will continue. Um, they may mature and change just as we get bigger and, you know, have like dedicated teams to certain sub projects. You might not hear from me on every single corner of case thing, but that's more a growth thing. It's not really a uh, the IPO changing our communication strategy because we've kind of adopted that already. Uh, along those same lines, maybe uh, I saw a music video of Gene dancing on Twitter recently. Uh was that real or AI? I promise you, if there's a video of me dancing, it's AI. That's, um, we'll see how you feel. I'm going to try to get a video of you dancing after we're public. I think maybe that's the one time it won't be AI. Um, we've got a sort of a long one here, so bear with me. Uh, you, Gene, you've once said that the Chia Network wants to offer its services to the banking segment. Uh, there was uh, some mention of seeing interviews on some YouTube channels about that specific uh, sphere when re with related to crypto. Uh, Chia is always compared to Ethereum and Bitcoin. Uh, this uh, the question asker is interested in a certain project who may be fighting with the SEC for several years. I'm not sure which the, which project they're specifically talking about here. Maybe perhaps Ripple uh, that is also aimed at bank at the banking market uh, and is a serious competitor at least in their mind. Uh, I would like to hear why you feel we're superior to them. Uh, and thanks for your time. So it is Ripple that they're talking about. And Ripple, first of all, doesn't have smart contracts. So an entire category of opportunity just isn't even comparable. Uh, there's two other issues. Ripple isn't really a blockchain. Ripple is you trust 20 people or less, and maybe a lot less, to ultimately validate your transaction. Uh, Ripple has a known consensus failure bug they didn't fix. At least Stellar tried to fix it. Uh, so it's kind of a DLT. It's not really a public blockchain. And then there's this little matter of the SEC is not really exactly happy with them. So if you're a bank, the last thing you want to do is buy XRP and registered security in the United States. If you think it's hard enough to hold crypto, it's harder to hold crypto than an unregistered security. So it, it is not really competing in the smart contract war. Uh, and you know, ultimately, like, look, when I talk to Wall Street and they talk about what's going to succeed and who's going to win here, the conversation is, can Chialis beat Solidity? There's really no other conversation. You know, even if Bitcoin adopts Chialis, it's Chialis and Bitcoin Lisp versus Solidity. It's not, uh, you know, a third way yet. You know, there's some outside chance that something like Move at uh, the Facebook uh, post uh, new blockchains could make inroads. But, you know, we think they have made poor choices around consensus that get back to those issues that banks and governments worry about, about not actually being decentralized, even if that is a little more decentralized than Ripple. As an addendum to that question, uh, do you feel that there's any concern about uh, projects that are seeking to incorporate other languages other than TypeScript or JavaScript into the Solidity platform? And is that something we're interested in doing? Or do we feel very strongly that Lisp is the, the one true smart contract language? We think that the Bitcoin model, the UTXO now coin model, is the absolute right answer when you're building a blockchain. And once you make that right answer, that the there isn't really a better solution than Chialisp. Uh, there's really no good reason to deviate from Chialisp once you make the Bitcoin security assumptions. And you know, the good news, as I said, is that at least you see with Move that those projects are are coming around to our concerns with these smart contracting environments need to be much more secure, much more limited, much more auditable. But again, it's not, in our view, far enough. You really need to take that hard step going into a language like, you know, Lisp, Clojure, those kinds of things, because otherwise you're not going to be able to reason about these contracts in a high threat environment. And remember, you know, today it's the North Koreans you're up against. 
in 15 years, you're going to be up against the G7 securities entities. You know, this is what blockchains ultimately are. They are a public battlefield. And if you do not have a smart contract environment that is ready for that, you're not going to make it. To, to piggyback on that, uh, for those not aware, uh, nation state cyber uh, warfare divisions stockpile zero days like some people collect baseball cards. Uh, there are likely bugs that have not been exposed that are very fatal that nation states are aware of that they're keeping in their back pocket for a day when they need to try to topple some entity. Uh, and so we think of our security patterns, not just in what's going to be secure this year, but what's going to be secure in five years and 10 years and 20 years, uh, because your adversaries here are very well funded and have a very uh, aggressive stake sometimes in uh, knocking competition down a peg. Um, and so I just want to stress that, like, you know, these are not just this year, year long, two year long horizons we're discussing here. Uh, Paul, we've got a question for you. Uh, it's about L2s. Uh, what are your thoughts on the timing of layer two? Uh, do you expect L2 to be deflationary pressure on L1 fees? Well, I'll take the first part and maybe Gene, you want to cover the deflationary part. Um, uh, we're currently uh, finalizing testing for uh, a set of uh, ELS operators that will enable uh, after release, the the development of some LTs on chip. Um, one of those would look like a zero knowledge proof rollup. Uh, so once once those land and ship and activate as a soft fork, we'll see uh, the ability to start building an LT. Uh, that's not a quick and dirty job. <laughs> Uh, you'll see uh, something like a ZK rollup on Chia take probably into next year um, and go through security audits and testnet and the whole process. So I could see that taking another year or more for sure. Uh, in the meantime, there are a couple of other L2 projects uh, that are already uh, underway. Uh, we don't think that there's just one L2 to rule them all on Chia. Uh, Bram, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, building poker as a way of really building an L2 on chain, which is a payment channel network. Um, and so we're making uh, some good progress on that. Uh, and then thirdly, related to that is the ability to uh, create very high volume uh, trading of offer files as its own form of, of an L2. Um, and so you'll hear more from us on that soon. Uh, we think that that is a way in which trading will scale, uh, particularly for trading uh, uh, assets peer to peer. Uh, and so you hear more work on us with that, which is independent of the ZK rollup. Uh, and so there's more to come on that. Uh, all that is to say, there, we're thinking a lot about scaling. Uh, you know, a blockchain that that starts and finishes at only doing, you know, 40 TPS, which is our end state, uh, would be not complete. Uh, we we know that scale uh, is coming and we're actively engaged on, on making that happen. Uh, Gene, do you want to talk about the deflationary uh, aspect of an LT? Yeah. And before I do that, I want to just add one little thing to you, what you were saying, which is, you know, a lot of our go-to-market strategy with the uh, business side is to have real demoable pieces of these things. Because, you know, today we can demo offers, we can demo data layer. Uh, soon we'd like to be able to demo some of the L2s. And by the way, data layer is an L2. Um, so there are certain L2 capabilities that data layer actually enables. So, you know, it's kind of a mix of that. And so our, our real goal here in the short term is to be able to demo what Bram's been doing, both, you know, as uh, peer to peer gaming, but also as uh, offer file settlement potentially, right? Uh, so with that, um, let me talk about fees and the way we see the world with fees. There's kind of three time periods for fees as the Chia blockchain grows up. Um, we're in time period one. And in time period one, up and until we really have a sustained 40 TPS, you're not really going to see much fee pressure. There's really no need yet for a, t a, a layer two because you really could do all this stuff on layer one very inexpensively. You want to see it for certain other applications of things that might quickly move through the 40 TPS. And, you know, you may have some things like trading where you'd like to be able to 
shorten settlement times from, you know, what is kind of one minute slash two and a half minutes for finality down to, you know, web two seconds that then would confirm out later. So that's the first period. The second period is kind of weird. The second period is what a lot of the other blockchains are currently in, which is once you kind of get sustained fee pressure, it forces uh, people who've been doing things inefficiently to go get more inefficient. And so what happens, you'll always see is that you have this period where all of a sudden then fee pressure starts to fall often. And so you've got this weird, weird period where like some people might want to go to L2 because they're worried that fee pressure is coming back. And so that can actually take a little fee pressure out. But that period is just kind of this ugly teenage years of, you know, the fee market digesting L2s and digesting overall demand. But your period three is that those L2s have to settle down on L1. And in fact, you're starting to see this over on Ethereum where the rollups are actually starting to use a significant amount of block space. And once you start hitting that, you get to the place where everybody's expectations are pretty well met that if your transaction is not worth 10 bucks, you don't do it on L1. Uh, now, in Ethereum's world, it's so hard to move between the various scaling strategies and you basically have to bridge that it's not going to be like that with Chia. With Chia, you just spend and it's a much more kind of direct and trustless in and out than what you're doing in a lot of the L2 scenarios on Ethereum. Uh, and also, look, payment channels, you know, again, are just spins. And in that sense, coming in and out of a ch- uh, payment channel, there's a lot of opportunity for you to very easily move around. And, you know, you're your coalition can all decide that you're all going to be on this part of an L2 and that's therefore where all the trading occurs. And that's a kind of easy social coordination problem and not a technology problem. So in the third era, we think you get to a world where, you know, L1 is full, but it's doing things that are aggregated of high volume transactions where, you know, you're not buying a cup of coffee on L1. You're rolling up $50 million worth of coffee from this morning on L1. Thank you, Gene. Uh, we have another one here uh, for Gene. Uh, has there been any interest in the data data layer solution uh, from county city clerk uh, or municipal records keeping offices uh, for things like public records, deeds, that sort of thing? Yeah, I would say uh, yes, but right now we're actually more focused at the state level. And there are forward thinking states that are looking at blockchain for all the right reasons. Uh, this is especially true around verifiable credentials. You know, the state governments, some of them are aware that they shouldn't be holding people's PII because they're no good at it. You know, if you think if you think the data collectors in the private sector are bad, you should be government. Uh, And so, you know, we are actively engaged with certain governments to be able to do things like uh, vocational licensing as kind of first steps. And, you know, think about what happened with a lot of the COVID vaccination uh, credentials. It's the same sort of thing with other credentials from the state. And so a lot of those are, you know, get in, do something uh, at first simple and deliverable for a win and then start talking about bigger things like driver's licensure or, you know, confirming property title, not the core, but, you know, the actual records and those sorts of things. So, so we expect that we'll probably partner with a couple of different states at the state level or at the, uh, you know, government level versus uh, non-US. And then that will drive the smaller governments to seeing the opportunities there, I think. Thank you, Gene. Uh, Let's see here. Uh, There was a question about... Okay, this is a good one. Uh, What is the pricing model uh, for the VPB, uh, the virtual private blockchain thing that we've uh, recently announced? Uh, Transactions are flat fees. And will that always be the case? And kind of what do we see as, uh, you know, that ecosystem's development? So unfortunately, I can't say that there's one method that we're used to price because you'll have different kinds of applications or services. So in a like digital asset issuance scenario, we'll probably charge an upfront fee to integrate, develop any extra infrastructure, often working with another SI like, you know, IBM or the big four uh, to do the web 2 e stuff that has to happen in the back end infrastructure for these kind of modernization projects. Uh, but then the ongoing subscription services are around things like finality management, security updates, uh, running a high quality wallet infrastructure internally, helping them with their test nets. Uh, if it's like an asset issuance, we're probably going to have a variable pricing model in that subscription of, you know, if you have 100,000 wallets because your municipal bond only has 100,000 buyers, it's one price. But if it has 500,000, it's a higher price. So, you know, in that world, that's how that would work. In a data layer model, it could often be total records per period. You know, we're really going to scope it and scale those subscription revenues to kind of the size of the project. But each of the projects tends to have a little bit of, you know, customization about what the right metric is to charge against. And to be clear, you know, this is a direct relationship. We'll be charging in fiat 
uh, from banks and governments and enterprises as we already are today in certain situations like the CAD Trust and others. Got another one for you here, Paul. Uh, is there any update on the wallet SDK for iPhone? Yeah, um, so I mentioned earlier that we're uh, doing a lot of work around custody. Uh, as part of that, we are planning uh, a new wallet architecture from the ground up. Uh, and that includes uh, uh, SDKs for community keys. Um, we don't have a specific SDK in mind for iPhone development, uh, though I did mention earlier on the hardware front, um, we have some thoughts uh, around hardware wallet and, uh, and iPhones, and we'll share more on that very soon. Uh, but generally speaking, on mobile devices, where I think Chia is going to probably start and end is around enabling signing. Uh, as opposed to an SDK for a light wallet protocol uh, that looks like our reference wallet uh, on the desktop today. We're, we're not likely to move down that path uh, ourselves. Um, and there are some really great, uh, you know, mobile wallets out there already. Um, so you're, you're gonna continue to see us support those wallet players in growing uh, their capabilities as opposed to us releasing stuff to build competing. Wallets. Yeah, and just to, to be clear, you know, what we might do with like key management on an iPhone, we'd be available to all wallet providers, including ourselves. And as we go down through the wallet SDK, you know, we want to get to a place where everybody can kind of grab the guts of the wallet and then use their UI against it and don't have to write all that again and again and again. But the whole point is that they can go build competitive and better wallets. You know, the reference wallet is a is a thing we have to have. Uh, we have to kind of explain how this new stuff works often and give people the first pass at it. But we absolutely really want community-driven and ecosystem-driven tools to be the dominant various types of wallets for different use cases. Thanks, gents. Uh, that appears to be pretty much all the time we have. I want to leave a few minutes here in case there are anything pressing that anybody here wanted to be sure we covered. Um, if not, I can I can grab some of the the more fun questions and we can we can close out with some some silliness here i have to toss one at you so uh, when is one of the kids minting those nfts behind you <laughs> uh well actually we're, we're almost at the point now where it's easy enough for uh you know a grade school kid to, to mint nfts so uh we are getting there um i i was initially bearish on the idea but it's kind of grown on me so uh you know, maybe sometime this summer i'll you know, we'll need some arts and craft projects while my kids are out of school got another fun one here someone was asking uh <laughs> Will there ever be the opportunity for companies to release movies on the blockchain? I don't think you're going to put the movie on the blockchain, but you might put the uh, provenance, the hash, and all of the data on the blockchain. So, you know, you're going to get the stream somewhere else, but you would be able to say, yeah, that absolutely was released by Paramount and got right on by and blah, 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 blah. Uh, you know, I would say if you are so motivated uh, and you have a, a video that you own the copyright for, you could mint that inside of an NFT. Uh, I don't know that I would recommend it. Uh, but it is that is an option if you really want to release your film on the blockchain. Uh, that is a, a way that you could do that uh, yeah, with the, you know, the caveats of any media assets related to uh, NFTs, the hosting being the um, you know, the linchpin there. Although we do have some pretty cool like data layers of service things that make that less of a uh, a, a weird kludge you have to throw together and more of a thing you can rely on. Hey, Paul, Win Beard. You're muted. I'm on, I'm on the case. Next day, I'm maybe even this one. Qu questioner wanted to know why there was <laughs> yeah. one one person without a beard. Yeah, we're we're a long way away from no shave November, guys. <laughs> Summertime. No, no shave November, as I call it, amateur month. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite meme cat, guys? Uh, mine is Space Bucks because it's the yeah, the stable coin. It is never oh, traded yeah. above or below its peg. I don't even know that there are ones. Space bucks for life. A couple <laughs> others. There's like Big D and there's Pepe on Gia, you know. But yeah, Space Bucks is the OG. Marmacoin. I mean, Marmacoin's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I heard uh, Yak complaining that there was not enough liquidity in the uh, AMM for Marmot. Uh, I don't think anybody wants to throw their valuable Marmot coin in, in the mix yet, but uh, <laughs> maybe we'll see. <laughs> Uh, 
All right, then I think that pretty much wraps us up for this AMA, guys. I really appreciate you guys coming to attend today and appreciate the community uh, for your questions. As always, you guys ask really, really insightful questions that uh, I'm glad we have Gene and, and, and Paul and Jam around to answer because they bake my brain. Um, That's thanks, it. thanks, everyone. Yep, thanks, everybody. We'll be on YouTube uh, later today. Yep, as soon Bye. as the video rasterizes, we'll get it uploaded.